I wanted to conduct this workshop almost as an open forum uh, for discussion. Um, so maybe because um, one of the topics that I wanted to address is um, Asians and Amer Asian Americans in the media. Um, we'll uh, maybe just ask for a show of hands of um, who in this room has aspirations uh, to dabble in entertainment. Just raise your hands. Okay, so not many. Um, so um, maybe let's let's start with uh, let's start on the right here in the white shirt, blue collar. Uh, what um, what what area were you were you kind of thinking about if you were to uh, work in entertainment? So hosting. Okay, um, and then um, let's hear some more uh, folks as far as uh, different um, areas where you'd like to possibly work. Who, uh, who else was raising their hands before about uh, working in the field? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, I like to do film directing. Okay, directing, all right. Uh, who else? Who else raised their hands about curiosity of entering entertainment? I saw a few more hands, so uh, uh, yes. I wanted to uh, open a movie theater chain in Vietnam. Movie theater chain in Vietnam. Okay, that's a big uh, endeavor, but uh, you know, anything's possible. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Anything's possible. Um, no, I'm serious. Anything's possible. I think that. Um, um, uh, I don't know if any of you have been back to Vietnam, but there are a few major uh, movie chains. Uh, there's Galaxy, uh, there's BHD, there's Megastar. Uh, Megastar was an American, uh, I believe if I'm correct, it was an American company that opened up movie chains in Vietnam and they just got bought out by the Koreans. So we see a lot of that happening in Vietnam right now, which are um, foreign investors coming in and just kind of seeing that as, a, as an emerging market and, and trying to tap into that. So you see a lot of Korean investors, Taiwanese investors, Hong Kong investors, uh, Singaporean. Yes? Of uh, movie theaters that are big right now? Uh, I probably went back like four years ago. Uh -huh. It was still fairly new. Um, I've had friends there, but I still used to watch it and they didn't even know anything about it. Yeah, they have stadium seating now. Um, so uh, Megastar is the most plush um, movie theater. Tickets, um, if you have to compare the industry in Vietnam, the budgets are lower because the ticket prices are lower. Right. So Megastar, which is the premium uh, movie theater, uh, their tickets are 90, uh, uh, so that would be um, about $5. Uh, and then Galaxy is a little bit less, about 75,000 uh, dong, so it's about $4. I think, and then um, uh, every year they're building more. So the film industry is growing. It's one of the things, maybe I'll, I was gonna talk about Asian American media first, but the other thing I was gonna talk about is the growing industry of film in Vietnam. So if we're gonna talk about that topic, I'll continue. Um, uh, I think five years ago, there were maybe 60 uh, screens nationwide. Um, now it's double, so you're getting maybe 120 screens nationwide. Uh, so <clears throat> screens, I'm not talking about the actual theater. The actual theater will have six or seven screens, right. like, like they have here at the Megaplex. Uh, so you're, you're talking about uh, basically 40 screens in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, and then 30 screens in Hanoi, and then you've got a few in Da Nang, and, and so it kind of spreads out. So it's 120, but every year they're, they're building more and more. Yeah, and that's, that's, a ref that's a reflection of the growing economy in Vietnam. So now you have a middle class uh, where the kids can afford to uh, go to the movies. I'm guessing uh, it's like mainly like subtitles? Well, uh, they show a lot of American movies, uh, and um, they're the main season where they show Vietnamese films would be Tet. Uh, so they'll have the five Tet films. And uh, periodically uh, during the year, they'll show some Vietnamese films. But feature films, like a, a, a typical long uh, movie, uh, there are only um, 
15, about 15 uh, uh, Vietnamese films released a year. The rest are mostly Hollywood films, and then they'll get some Chinese blockbusters too. Uh, so that's the makeup of um, uh, what's sh being shown in the theaters. Uh, now the government um, is, um, there. they have a law that says that um, there has to be a certain amount of Vietnamese films shown in theaters, which I think is good because otherwise Hollywood would just dominate. They have the same thing in France, which is basically um, all the screens in France, at least 50% of the films have to be uh, French produced to preserve the culture. So I think that uh, they do that in Vietnam, but not too much, because I think in China, what they only allow 20% Hollywood films. The 80% have to be Chinese. So they really, really want to preserve their culture. Uh, so, The censorship process is basically uh, when you uh, make a movie in Vietnam, you submit the script. And uh, if there's no problems, they'll give you a permit. Uh, if they have some problems, they will ask you to uh, make uh, changes to the script. Um, <clears throat> but I've noticed that it's becoming a lot more relaxed. Um, if you saw Saigon Electric last night, um, I know there are some technical difficulties, but uh, within the film, when I wrote the script, I had scenes with them um, spray painting graffiti, and then I also had scenes uh, of um, one of the main characters kind of overdosing on ecstasy. So um, when I wrote these drug scenes, I always knew that they could say, hey, you know, we have a problem with it, but when I submitted it, they said nothing. So. <clears throat> Um, what happens after that is you get the permit and they assign you a sensor um, to follow you around and make sure that you're shooting what's on the script and that you don't uh, go rogue and shoot other stuff that's not supposed to be shot. Um, <clears throat> I guess because I had already worked in Vietnam and um, I had never done anything to um, uh, uh, give them alarm that I would go rogue. Um, the sensor that was assigned to Saigon Electric never showed up. Uh, he popped in, I think, uh, the first day for 20 minutes, <clears throat> said hello, and I never saw him again. Until uh, there were two instances. It's interesting. Um, <clears throat> there was a scene, I don't know if you saw the film, but there's a scene when uh, Kim and Hai are uh, in Vung Tau, and they're having um, intimate scenes of talking inside the hotel room. So he showed up for that, just to make sure we weren't doing any adult filmmaking or anything like that. Um, because you have two young people in a hotel room. So he has to do his due diligence, because if the film was ever shown and we had graphic sex, he would probably be in prison for not doing his job. So he showed up, he saw the rehearsal, was like, OK, they're talking. Uh, it's, it's just a talking scene. And then he left, and I didn't see him again until the day when uh, we shot the scene uh, where the, the, the club DJ gives Kim uh, ecstasy. And then he pops up, and then he was a little bit, you know, alarmed. Um, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter was that the, the scene was in the script, <clears throat> the script was approved, so uh, it was okay. And then he left. And, and that was it. Um, so it's becoming a lot more relaxed. Um, the only things that are still taboo uh, is anything political. Uh, and um, uh, anything that's graphic, so graphic violence, graphic sex, you know, yeah, a hard rated R is, is, is a little bit touchy. Uh, but typically, uh, Vietnamese audiences in Vietnam love comedy, um, and um, that's what, you know, your parents probably watch as well, you know, when they're watching stuff from Vietnam, they're probably watching comedy. Um, so. Uh, I'll go over the second topic that I was going to address, which is basically um, Vietnamese Americans working in film and the trend that's happening. Um, I'm going to bring up an example of, of people that I work with, my peers. Um, uh, I'm good friends with uh, Dustin Nguyen, uh, who was on 21 Jump Street, and then he was on that Pamela Anderson show in the 90s, and then... Uh, as an Asian American actor, the roles for him were very limited. And he saw that the uh, film industry and, and TV as well, um, I'm not just talking about movies, but uh, reality TV shows are being made, you know, so it's like 
Dancing, Dancing with the Stars, Vietnam version, that kind of thing. Those are being made now as well. Um, he saw the potential of a, a, an emerging market in Vietnam, so he went back to Vietnam and started acting, and then eventually he opened up a, a production company. So he, uh, he's basically in Vietnam 10 months out of the year uh, working. Um, and um, one of the things that he wants to do is, is to help the industry grow there. So besides him, I know, um, I don't know if you guys follow Vietnamese films, but I have a very good director friends like Charlie Wynn, who did The Rebel, and Victor Vu, uh, and, and um, a few others, and myself included. Um, we've been actually going back to Vietnam because that's where the industry, if you want to do Vietnamese content, is. Uh, otherwise, if you do Vietnamese content in the US, uh, your market is basically Asian American film festivals. And that's really about it. You can't really um, uh, pay back your investors uh, very well. Uh, but because there is actual uh, a demand for Vietnamese films in Vietnam, that's why a lot of Vietnamese American filmmakers are going back and, and working. And because the crews are getting better, the actors are getting better, uh, the process is streamlined. Yes, you had a question? Mm -hmm. Well, I have. I mean, uh, I've done a couple films, and uh, typically I'll get the comment that my, my stuff, uh, my dialogue tends to be very thin. So um, what uh, I do is, uh, because you're right, um, uh, the word that you're look, the word that describes what you said is um, the films uh, the dialogue is very kit, uh, which is very yeah. theatrical, uh, and that's because the the dialogue that's written doesn't allow for naturalism with the actors, so they're kind of like tongue twisters and, and it just feels very uh, stiff in stage. So, yeah. Well, yeah, the, the reason is that um, the directors are, or the writers, they write the script and the directors tell the actors to stick to the script. So, um, so um, what I do when I make films in Vietnam is uh, I rehearse with the actors and we have the script, but we um, allow the actors to um, go off the script and be more free with the dialogue. Um, so, you know, uh, basically my direction to them is if there's a few words you want to change to make it more thingy, um, you know, I give them the freedom to do that. So um, it makes the acting a little bit better, I think, because they're more comfortable with what they're saying. Um, so that's, that's my technique, and I, I don't know if other people are doing it. Um, uh, allowing for freedom uh, is the thing. But usually, if you know, the, the typical Vietnamese director in Vietnam, they're dictators. So they'll basically say, this is the script, you say the words, and then, you know, there's no question about it. And so I think that's a problem. That's why a lot of times, you know, or it's the fact that, um, you know, uh, a popular director is uh, Chen An Hong, who did, you know, Sense of Green Papaya. So his dialogue tends to be very stiff, but he writes in a very French way. So coming out of a Vietnamese mouth, it, it, it feels stiff. Oh, interesting, yeah. I, I hate dub stuff, yeah. I feel like when you re-record dialogue after a movie's done, it takes away um, no, 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 no. all the...
Yeah, but it's still re-recorded. Yeah, it's still re-recorded, which means it's it's fake. It's not recorded at the time. So I typically, you know, I don't watch stuff that, like, you know. <laughs> we The thing in Vietnam is um, they always used to re-record sound after because um, uh, Vietnam's a very noisy country, so when you're recording live sound, you're going to hear a lot of traffic. Um, but then they started realizing that um, it was fake, and audiences were getting more savvy. So now even Vietnamese productions in Vietnam, uh, at least half of them, uh, they try to do live sound so that what's being said at the time is, is real and not re-recorded four months later in a studio. Um, so, um, yeah, basically, uh, you know, there are a lot of Vietnamese Americans going back uh, in film, but besides that, there's also advertising. Um, there's PR. Uh, there's a lot of burgeoning uh, industries. And um, I think that uh, uh, people find it exciting. So I don't know if any of you have questions about, um, you know, I think one of the things that I wanted to pose as a question is, do you see your future here, or does any of you want to kind of dabble and go back to Vietnam? And, and if so, um, what are your uh, preconce uh, preconceived notions, and what are your fears? And sometimes it may be like, oh, your parents don't want you to go back, you know? But I mean, do any of you uh, feel like you want to go back and give it a shot? Well, uh, there's a process. Um, so, um, what did you? What were you thinking about doing over there? Um, well, I was just thinking about opening like, uh, a business, like a restaurant. Business. Okay. It would be tough. Yeah, it would be tough. Uh, you really got to be connected. I mean, to open up a proper business. Uh, like a restaurant or, you know, a, a hotel or something like that. Um, and some people are able to do that because they still have ties in Vietnam with family. So, you know, it's always just kind of like channeling the paperwork through them. But if you don't have, I have a, you know, I have my, my, I have a French cousin. He wanted to open up a bed and breakfast uh, there this past year. And I saw him there in April and I, um, I felt really, really bad for him because um, he's a, he was a French national and he didn't speak any Vietnamese uh, and he had a tiny budget to open up a bed and breakfast and then he found out the hard way how hard it was to, to open up a business and he just quit. Um, and that was a danger because he always went back to Vietnam to Nha Trang, whatever, on the beaches for vacation, which is fine, but to do business there, is, it's quite different. Uh, it can be easy, but it can be very tough. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you said there wasn't much of a market for these movies in America. Mm -hmm. so, um, you said there was a lot of big Asian American festivals. Like, to me, the distribution of those things in America, is there a future for movies like this in America? With, like Netflix and streaming modes and uh -huh. demand for to be able to get a return on your investment, um, do you have to do you have to bring it to Vietnam to get a return on your investment? It's a lot easier. If you do, um, I mean, and it's not even Vietnamese Americans. There's a lot of Taiwanese Americans that are going back to Taiwan to, to do movies because um, there's more um, investors there to invest in you know, Taiwanese content. Chinese Americans going back to China. Um, there's a lot of that happening. So the challenge about making Asian American films in America is um, uh, if you're going to release it in the theater, filling up those seats with people and um, also uh, finding a market um, because we have so many choices here. And it's like you guys, um, uh, as much as you want to support Vietnamese American films or Vietnamese American arts, you're always going to gravitate towards mainstream stuff because you were, you were raised here. So, you know, you, you're, you're going to watch uh, Step Up 3 more than you're going to watch Saigon Electric or you're going to watch, you know, uh, 
Hunger Games more than you would watch a Vietnamese American action movie. Uh, that's just going to where, where you're going to gravitate. Is it, a, is it a risky proposition for people to invest in Vietnamese uh, movies like yours, or is there a lot of money coming in to produce movies like yours? Um, the only, if you were to do a business proposal for a Vietnamese film, you would really have to tell your investors that there is money to be made in the box office in Vietnam because uh, the audience in Vietnam will watch Vietnamese faces on the screen, whereas Vietnamese audiences here um, are not inclined to do so. Um, so the only real money-making venture for Vietnamese entertainment in the U.S., un unfortunately, is, you know, are the Paris by Night tapes. And uh, that's the stuff, you know, your parents watch. Um, but, yeah, that's the only real money-maker. Yeah. I guess to add on to um, kind of his uh, point on returning for investors, return for investors, um, I know in America, like, going to movie theater, it's, it's a very common thing. When you're in middle school, when you're in high school, even now, like, people go to movie theaters all the time. But um, in Vietnam, it's a very poor country, and I know my family over there, they don't really go watch movies or anything, so how, or like, what's kind of like the, the prospect of audiences that you can attract in Vietnam for like, watching movies and stuff? It's big. I mean, if you, uh, if you go to Vietnam now and you go into a movie theater, you're going to notice a lot of teens, a lot of people in their 20s, uh, dates, uh, couples going in, um, uh, parents bringing their kids. Um, I saw, um, um, what was that, um, uh, that Will Smith, his kid, what was that, um, the Karate Kid. The, so the Karate Kid, I saw that in Vietnam, and there's a lot of parents that were bringing their kids to watch that. And um, so it just becomes, um, it's not something that everyone can afford to do. I guess it would be the same here, because, you know, $12 a ticket, I don't know how much it is in Cincinnati, but you know, some places in, in LA are, are like 12 bucks. Uh, it's a little bit prohibitive for some people, um, but um, for the most part, it's, it's because the economy is growing in Vietnam, they can't afford to go. Definitely, yeah. Um, so, um, basically, uh, you know, that's, that's the thing. I think that we want to, if we can, tell uh, Vietnamese American stories in, in America, but it's like, on the, on the business side, it, uh, who's going to pay for that, you know, and, and which audience is going to watch that to be able to justify spending you know, at least two to three hundred thousand dollars making a movie. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. I know you're an artist, but like, how much of a concern money-wise is it for you in terms of executing your screenplay? Um, I know, like, you probably want to concentrate on the story and like filming more than the money itself. But is that a is that a huge like pull on what comes from starting your movie? Because I know you did some products recently. Yeah, I always have to think about the budget um, because uh, I have a responsibility when I make a film. Half of it is the creative process, which is casting well and you know putting a good crew together and telling the story and 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 having nice visuals. But the other half is okay. Here's some investors; they put some money in the film, so I have a responsibility to pay them back. So if we go over budget. Uh, that hurts, and if we go over schedule, that that hurts. So um, I guess I'm more of a responsible uh, director, because um, some some directors it's all about the vision; they don't really care about, you know, the nuts and bolts of the financing. But I have to kind of divide my um, focus on on both both areas. And then afterwards, too, when the film is done, and hopefully you've made a good movie, now you have to go out and sell it and try to get it distributed. So you have to put in the business hat again. Um, so it really is art and commerce together. Uh, and I can't stress that enough. Uh, if you are an artist, it's good to think about the commerce, about how to get your work out there and, and how to uh, try to make a living doing it by any means necessary, whether it's creating websites so that you can start branding your stuff, whether you do photography or or movies or music. Uh, I know a lot of Vietnamese American uh, music artists that um, have to do that as well. They have to 
make a CD and then they have to build a website and they have to play gigs and start branding their music. It's the same. Saigon Electric was uh, typical. I'll, I'll give you an example. Typically, a, um, a, a film on the low end in Vietnam will cost about four hundred thousand, um, and uh, we did that for we did the film for half. So basically, uh, because I shoot fast, uh, we were able to do the film in uh, shooting in four weeks or twenty four days, so four six day weeks, and um, there was nobody super. I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's you know out the door, um, and part of it is because there was nobody like super famous in the film. Uh, so the actors, their salaries are a little bit lower. The dancers, it was their first time, so their salaries are a little bit lower. You know, um, so we were very responsible with the budget, and uh, that made the investors like you know a little bit more secure about uh, putting money into the film. Um, so again, you know, art and commerce. Um, so, any more? Yes, there's only a few of you guys, and everyone else is observing. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, you you try to tailor it. So, uh, when I did my first film, it was a total film that I wanted to make, which was an intimate drama. And I made it in, the, in, in a style that was kind of European. So when I made um, Owl and the Sparrow, I, I said, I'm going to make this for like an international kind of festival crowd. And it worked, because it won a lot of awards at film festivals. Then when I made Saigon Electric, uh, I tried to uh, position it more for a younger generation because there's a it's about youth culture and it's also you know a dance movie, um, but there was enough story in in it where uh, older folks would would get into it because it has good morals. Um, so when the film was released in Vietnam, um, you would see like 13 year old b boys coming in with their parents and the parents would like it as well because they could get into the story. Um, so you, you aim for one demographic, but you know sometimes it, it works for another demographic. So when the film was released in the U.S. and we had a you know a nine cities and it it would play for two to four weeks, um, typically it wasn't the the younger demographics like you guys that would go out and see because typically college students you're either too busy or you have choices of entertainment. So in the theaters, uh, uh, the the audience. Typically, were parents that brought their kids. So, you know, yeah, you just kind of throw it out there and see, you know, who who it, who it works best for. Um, um, so, going back to the first topic I wanted to talk about in this forum, um, um, Asian Americans in the media. Uh, if we're getting away from Vietnam a little bit and coming back to the U.S. Um, there are lots of avenues for jobs. Um, so I mentioned earlier um, in the keynote that I know um, more and more guys, Vietnamese Americans, who are, you know, they're a little bit on the, the techie side, so they like uh, CG. So they're getting into visual effects, they're getting into visual effects companies, and they're making a living doing it. Um, and um, also, um, uh, female executives as well in the studios. Um, as far as actors, um, that's tough and it, it will remain tough um, unless there are more Asian American filmmakers who are creating content to give them work. So if there's a show like Hawaii Five-0, then you can cast some Asians in that. You know, otherwise, um, there's very very little work for Asian American actors, and it's very hard to get those roles because I know I know Vietnamese American actresses and. When they'll go into audition for a role, it's um, it's really kind of uh, heartbreaking because they'll walk into an audition room in the and in, in the waiting area and they'll see forty other Asian girls that look just like them going for the same role for a Taco Bell commercial, you know, and that's how tough it is. Uh, but you we can't really dissuade them because. Um, they're passionate about what they do. Actors love to act, so you can't really dissuade them from the passion. 
Uh, but what I told my nephew, you know, because I have a nephew who's uh, going to be in college in a few years, and he's really into um, journalism and sports journalism, and, and he's doing some short films at, in school projects in high school. Um, I actually told him to double major. So I said, you know, that's, that's fine if you want to do journalism, but um, maybe it'd be good to kind of, you know, do a double major. And it's like, what do you like to do? He goes, well, I like sports. And I said, okay, you could go into physical therapy. You could be a trainer. Uh, but it's good to kind of balance the, the art with the commerce. And you could do that at the university by double majoring. So that's what I would recommend now, because I know how hard it is. It's really, really hard. Yes. Uh, um, while on the topic of Asian Americans, um, I wanted to get your opinion and whatnot on these Asian Americans that are making quite a living through YouTube, since you are the legitimate director. Um, so you don't have any fancy lighting or camera or any, you know, um, anything fancy at all. I think it's great, but I think that um, uh, audiences, even on, for YouTube, are getting more sophisticated. So the whole webcam thing, uh, um, you know, low quality webcam, I don't know if that works, um, but getting um, uh, uh, your creative vision and having it executed well. You know, like the Wang Fu guys, I mean, they actually have good cameras and they have good camera guys and they make it, you know, professional. Um, I know that, um, I know the, the, the um, Just Kidding Films, those two guys, um, Uncle Sam, Uncle Chin, you know, I, I know them, um, I see them from time to time. But they started off very low grade quality like that. And slowly they started getting better cameras and, 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 and better directors. Uh, but their content in the beginning was good. And uh, they've, they've built a fan base doing that. And they actually make some revenue uh, through their YouTube channel uh, by getting enough hits. So I think that's a great um, way. I think that it needs to be um, comedy because uh, you're talking about short format, five minutes, ten minutes, so that always works well for comedies. Uh, so, you know, if you have a good sketch idea, a good skit idea, I think, yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, if I, ask, if I understand your question correctly, um, it's basically comedy for the sake of uh, uh, portraying an image of Asian Americans or even Vietnamese Americans. So, for example, I know a, co a comedian named Dat Fan, and like he was on NBC doing some, some stand-up, and he, um, his whole routine, his whole uh, shtick is, doing the, the, the FOB mom, you know? Um, and um, it works for him. You know, he's an Asian American comic and he kind of makes fun of his Vietnamese mom uh, and it, it works. So I don't think it's degrading at all, you know? Um, it's just kind of like a, a Mexican comic kind of mex making fun of, you know, things that are Mexican. It, there's no difference at all. Um, Yes. Oh, I just have a question because um, most directors probably have a first time actor. Mm -hmm. I noticed there are editions. Yes. So I was wondering, well, I know the movie is because the credits are on the movie and then she was in the movie. So I just wonder, is that a promotion method or did she just go to audition? Um, uh, Ellie, Ellie Chen Ha is. Um, 
I guess she's an internet model. Um, so she was popular on the web, on the internet, and um, uh, I had one role, and uh, we weren't, um, we didn't cast that role yet. We were auditioning people, and then one of the producers said, you know, um, Ellie Chen is actually in Saigon, and she's looking to get into acting. And I said, um, I'm not going to um, have high expectations, but let's bring her in to audition. <coughs> so we brought her in to audition, and um, she did a good job in the auditions. And the fact that people recognize her face uh, makes it better for the film. So it worked out. So it wasn't, it wasn't like we, we were, it wasn't like we were, oh, we must have her. Let's go find her. It was like, oh, she's available and she, she wants to get into acting. I said, okay, she's a model. Usually models can't act, but let's bring her in. And then she came in and she did a good job. So that's how that happened. Yeah. I'm sorry? It depends. Uh, the question is, would I put more famous film, uh, people in the movies? It really depends on um, the movie. Uh, depends on um, who is financing it. Um, I think that it helps uh, sell the film if you have recognizable faces, for sure. And that's the same here. You know, If you have Brad Pitt in a movie here, it's going to be easier to sell it to the audience. Um, but it really depends on the, on the type of film you're making. I mean, um, um, this year, I'll give you an example of where I'm at in my career. Um, this year, um, I have to find time to write uh, two scripts. Um, I'm taking a break from Vietnam. Uh, I have a project I like to do in, in the U.S., uh, which is for the, the cable networks like HBO. So fortunately, um, uh, next week I start pitching to the networks uh, because um, uh, American television is lucrative. There's a lot of money. And um, I think that you have the ability to do good work in television uh, via HBO or Showtime, uh, TNT. They're doing really good shows now. Uh, so I have a show that I'll be pitching next week to them. Um, but besides that, um, I have been wanting to do a film in Europe for a long time. Um, so I have to carve out a little bit of time. I'm going to do uh, two films that take place in, in Paris. So one will be a mainstream heist uh, movie um, that um, is going to be primarily in, in English. And that will be more of a, a heist action movie that takes place in Paris. Um, the other script that I'm going to write is going to be an intimate drama um, in Paris, but that's going to be in French language. So the intimate drama, you're not necessarily going to need stars in that, because that one is going to be more for a festival audience. Um, it's more of a, um, a drama, I guess, for a serious uh, movie-going audience. The um, mainstream heist movie, uh, that one will definitely need like some kind of a star. So it really depends on what type of project you're doing, if you're going to have try to get famous people or not. Um, I want to do a, uh, a big soccer movie in Vietnam. Um, so again, art and commerce. So uh, me wanting to do a big soccer movie in Vietnam de demands a budget. So to, to, to get the budget that I need, I actually have to put a star in the movie. So um, uh, in this particular story, it's going to be about the national football soccer team. But all of the, the, the soccer teams have foreign coaches. Um, so even in Vietnam, I think right now they have, they had uh, an Austrian coach for many years. I think, I don't know where he's from this year. But uh, in our film, it would be a, a, a coach from, from England, from the UK. So you can cast that, you can cast a movie star to play that. And then you can bring that person back to Vietnam and uh, have something a little bit more international. So again, art and commerce. I always try to balance the two. There are so many questions. Um, were you always a strong writer? And how long did it take for you to get from inception of Saigon Electric to finish screenplay? Um, uh, OK, um, the, uh, the question is a uh, concept to, to screen. Right, 
writing. Um, I think that if you watch enough movies, you should be able to get the rhythm of a movie in your head. So you know that every movie has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, so when you're writing a script, you should always have that rhythm. And then every scene should be about three minutes. Any scene longer than that, it slows down the movie. So every scene should be about three minutes, four minutes tops. So there's always a rhythm. And there are, there are formulas, too, which means you know, 30 minutes into a film, something has to happen. 60 minutes into a film, there's a turning point. 90 minutes of, to a film, there's a point of no return. And then the last 20 minutes of a film is the stretch. So there's a little bit of a formula that you learn as well. Um, I read a lot of scripts um, that come into LA. Um, and the problem that um, I find is a lot of it is plot and not enough character. And for me, um, I try to do character, and then I do the plot afterwards. So for something like Saigon Electric, um, the way that that came about is, OK, I'm going to do a film about youth culture. Who are my characters? And then I thought of the two girls. So I said, OK, here are the two girls. Uh, one's going to be a street dancer. One's a traditional dancer. And then the story revolves around that. So then I, I think of the two girls first, and then the story kind of shapes around the two girls. Uh, some people think of plot first and character second. I think of character first and then the plot second. So, so that's my, my process. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I'll take some more questions. Anyone, um, uh, I, I guess, more questions about maybe getting into entertainment? Uh, yeah, I can go ahead. It wasn't really the dancing that inspired me. It was the fact that I thought that it would be interesting to show uh, how modern Vietnam is becoming through the eyes of youth, through the eyes of uh, the youth generation. So if I'm portraying youth generation, it's like, OK, what would be a good vehicle to make this more entertaining? And it's like, all right, you know, hip hop's been popular for four years. Uh, let's tap into that. You know, and try to showcase uh, um, something to the outside world. Because uh, one of the things that I, what I like to do about doing Vietnamese films is I'm able to show them in an international festivals. So Saigon Electric, you know, I was in Paris last month showing it there, and then it was in Berlin. So it, it gets around, and it's always kind of showcasing what is really kind of strong about. Um, uh, Vietnamese culture, Vietnamese values. So in, in my films, uh, there's always a theme of family. Um, there's always, well, in this particular film, Saigon Electric, it's really about uh, what we call Nam Me, you know, uh, Mơ. so it's about dreams, passion. And those are very positive values. Um, and to show that to an international audience, it, it, I think it's, it's a good thing to kind of culturally for us. Uh, well, I, I think I just kind of wanted to sum up um, if there are no more questions about, again, really um, knowing that it's hard. And I don't know if any of you are going to pursue entertainment or not, but if you're not and you become doctors, lawyers, dentists, pharmacists, politicians, council people, um, to continue to um, support and promote uh, Vietnamese American artists because, um, you know, they need all the help. It, it really is, there's a sense of pride, you know, when you see um, uh, people who are trying to preserve the culture through poetry, through arts, uh, through media, and um, just kind of being, you know, proud of that. And just, you know, I have a lot of benefactors. I'll, t I'll give you an example. Saigon Electric, I mean, half of it was from a production company in Vietnam, but the other half, uh, there were um, it, uh, private investors from Texas, Vietnamese Americans, who were uh, architects and um, designers, uh, product designers, and they were big supporters of the arts. And um, they, they were um, champions of trying to continue to promote uh, uh, Vietnamese values through, through film. 
So I think we need more of that. So just, you know, just don't, don't forget about the artist when you guys make it big. Um, thank you very much. Um,